in that song, he is casting himself, whether he likes it or not, as the voice of a generation. Rock and roll died of its own weight, in a way. The folk scene was happening. The village was just this sort of swamp of clubs and coffee houses. The guitar was like a magnet, you know, it could draw people in. People did get influenced by the romantic idea of a guitar and a singer, and sing a sad song. All these little factions, there were some people that were just into blues, some people that were just into bluegrass, some people that were just into the protest part of it. How could you beat an era like that? I mean, it was just a great scene and had an energy all its own that's seldom been repeated. The thing about Dylan is that Dylan kind of signified a sea change and all of a sudden, you wrote your own song. It was just sort of like automatic, as opposed to no one even thought of doing that. And then suddenly, like, everyone didn't, didn't really think of doing that. Just thought, that's what you do. He changed everything. He's astonishingly better than almost everything else around him. When he started writing, that, that was a big paradigm shift right there. The bar was then set for, for good songwriting way, way before it was here, then it was here. This growing interest in folk music spread to Minnesota. Young Robert Zimmerman, whose first band had performed Little Richard numbers at their high school in the large mining town of Hibbing, was one of many to grow disenchanted by the commercialization of rock and roll and to subsequently be drawn to the earthier sounds offered by artists from the recent past. Dylan growing up in the 1950s, like uh, almost every American kid, his music is not folk music, it's, it's rock and roll and Elvis Presley and Little Richard. Uh, I, I mean, I suppose if you're Arlo Guthrie, then uh, it, it might be different, but uh, you'd be quite an unusual teenager to uh, be into folk music, uh, I think, uh, uh, at that age. There's a story, in fact, that he was given some old Lead Belly 78s on his graduation, and that was possibly his first introduction to, to this music, and he started learning and playing those songs. And carried you to captain. Wow. And tell him I'm gone. And tell him I'm gone. Wow. But the folk music epiphany really comes when he goes to college in the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, where he's a very poor attender of uh, lectures and a very assiduous attender of the uh, folk clubs and coffee houses in Dinkytown, the uh, sort of bohemian district next to the, to the campus. And uh, I think it was probably a girlfriend gave him his first uh, Woody Guthrie recordings. And he's transfixed. He describes this far more eloquently than I ever could in Chronicles when he describes the moment he first hears Woody Guthrie as uh, like a heavy anchor dropping into the deep waters of a harbour. I ain't got no home, I'm just a roaming round. Just a wandering worker, I go from town to town. And the police make it hard wherever I may go. And I ain't got no home in this world anymore. The Guthrie obsession grows and grows uh, until the point where he feels uh, he's, he's ready to make the road trip to, to New York and seek the great man out. Zimmerman, now going by the stage name Bob Dylan, left Minneapolis in December 1960, having outgrown the local scene in Dinkytown, and after a brief stay in Chicago, finally arrived in Manhattan on January the 24th, 1961. 
Ever since the early 1940s, when Pete Seeger, Led Belly, Josh White and Woody Guthrie had first congregated there, the city had remained the focal point of the folk world, and Dylan was just one of many artists drawn there from all across the US. It was a very romantic thing to come to New York. This was the place where the beats were. This was the place so many people were. Jackson Pollock worked there. All the abstract expressionists worked there. I mean, New York was it, of course. And um, San Francisco was very interesting, but it wasn't really it. It didn't have the gravitas uh, that New York did, or the, the history. It wasn't as big. It didn't have the energy. It wasn't quite the same. New York was most important. Like Sinatra said, you know, if you make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And uh, it was true then, and it's probably true now. On the night of his arrival, Dylan stumbled upon the Café Wa, a small venue known to the local musicians as a basket house, where donations from the audience were collected at the end of a set. Appearing on stage that very night as part of an open mic show, or Hootenanny, Across the following week, the young singer accustomed himself to the various clubs and cafes that made up the village folk circuit. The village was just this sort of swamp of clubs um, that catered to tourists sometimes, catered to the locals. They were like coffee houses that didn't have cabaret licenses, so anything that happened entertainment-wise was had to be for free. While keen to establish himself within this new, thriving environment, Dylan also had another priority. 30 miles west of Greenwich Village, Woody Guthrie was interned at Greystone Park State Hospital in New Jersey, suffering from Huntington's disease. Since his introduction to Guthrie's work, Dylan, like fellow Greenwich Village musician Rambling Jack Elliott, had begun to imitate not only the musical style, but also the mannerisms of the ailing older artist and his itinerant non-conformist lifestyle and ragged persona had proven inspirational. Over the following year, the young folk singer from Hibbing, Minnesota, was a regular visitor at Guthrie's bedside, and the pair became close friends. He came looking for Woody Guthrie. He didn't come looking for Pete Seeger. Woody struck a lot of people for his independent style, which I assume the younger people of that generation try to emulate the independence and the, the willingness to go a different way than the normal way and breaking away from family ties, living part hobo, just never getting down to a trade or, or a job. And it was a great experiment. Dylan was quite genuine in his love and admiration for Woody Guthrie. I mean, it's not a case of him cynically trying to ride on Guthrie's coattails. He goes out to the hospital and visits him, and, uh, you know, I think he's, he's, he's genuinely in awe of the man. But there's no doubt that because Guthrie warmed to Dylan and took him as a, a kind of unofficial protege in a way, that this helped Dylan enormously back in Greenwich Village. There's a story that when Dylan first visited Guthrie in hospital, Woody gave him um, a card which said on it, I'm not dead yet. And uh, Dylan went flashing this all around uh, um, uh, Greenwich Village. So, you know, he, 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 he literally was carrying Woody Guthrie's calling card. So yeah, it was an enormous help to him to have the support of such an influential figure. Dylan quickly progressed on a scene that was itself blooming. Having been accepted into the circles surrounding prominent members of the folk establishment through his friendship with Guthrie, including Pete Seeger, Alan Lomax and Jack Elliott, he also took up with his contemporaries on the scene. These fellow developing musicians, Marx Balestra, Richard Farina and Dave Van Ronk, among many others, provided not only a close-knit social group, but also a well of musical ideas and independently discovered material, which Dylan would actively absorb. By April, he secured a supporting slot opening for John Lee Hooker at Gerdes Folk City, and by May, he began to incorporate two of his own early compositions into his sets. Still seen as only one of a number of budding folk singers, however, Dylan pressed the New York Times folk critic Robert Shelton to review one of his shows, keen to rise to greater prominence. When Shelton finally agreed, the resultant review, published on the 29th of September, 1961, immediately established Dylan as an artist to watch. Dylan himself was soon to have an album of his own, 
Before the Shelton article had been published, the young folk singer had encountered Columbia Records producer and talent scout John Hammond at a recording session for fellow village artist Carolyn Hester. On October the 26th, 1961, nine months after his arrival in New York, Dylan was offered a contract with Columbia. Yet the Shelton article and his signing to a major label didn't propel the singer to the top of the village scene overnight. In autumn 61, Izzy Young, the owner of the Folklore Center, had offered to step in as Dylan's makeshift promoter. Yet his attempts to launch the artist as a major draw in his own right proved fruitless. Dylan entered Columbia Studios to record his self-titled debut. Now keen to distance himself from familiar criticisms of being imitative, the young musician decided to abandon his repertoire of Guthrie songs and tackle folk standards and traditionals, some of which he had appropriated from his peers. Although the LP would not prove a commercial success, it nevertheless provided evidence that even at this early stage, Dylan represented something new and original in a scene that was so bound up in tradition. Well, 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 so I can die easy. Well, well, well. And Dylan's own songwriting output began to develop at a prodigious rate after the recording of his debut. Although he was composing occasional songs while back on the Minneapolis scene, his immersion in the Greenwich Village folk world fully liberated his creativity. And by January 1962, on the back of the new material he was producing, John Hammond secured Dylan his first music publishing deal. This led to the recording of a seven-track demo, which collected together songs that the artist had mostly penned during the previous year. Well, the weak and the strong and the rich and the poor gather, gather. Yet where this early material lyrically conformed to either semi-autobiographical folk or traditional blues forms, by the end of January 62, Dylan's prolific pen turned unexpectedly towards contemporary protest songs. This shift in subject matter was not only traceable to the times themselves, but also to Dylan's girlfriend during this period, Suze Rotolo, who had moved into the singer-songwriter's apartment at the start of the year. This focus on contemporary issues brought Dylan directly into the orbit of one of the elder statesmen of the folk world. Despite only narrowly avoiding prison time following his appearance before the House Un-American Activities Committee, Pete Seeger had remained a prominent activist, closely associated with both the campaign for nuclear disarmament and the growing civil rights movement. In February 1962, with fellow folk singer Sis Cunningham and her husband Gordon Friesen, he founded Broadside, a magazine that would feature contemporary folk songs. Having heard his new material, Seeger was keen to bring Dylan on board for the first issue, and over the next two years, the young singer-songwriter would become the magazine's most regular contributor. If Dylan would soon prove that he had a staggering number of great songs in him, a new composition that he penned in April 62 was quickly recognized as both his first major work and the first significant original to emerge from the post-rock and roll folk revival, Blowing in the Wind. Yet at an early performance of this track, which would become an anthem for the civil rights movement, he was keen to inform the audience that it was not a protest song. When Dylan said about blowing in the wind, you know, they sang a protest song, I think that, you know, I think he was beginning to understand the limits of the world that he was moving in, at the same time as he understood what the potential impact of a song like blowing in the wind could be, you know, so that if it's a song, you know, kind of torn from the headlines that was about something that happened yesterday, well, tomorrow, it might not be that important. But if it's a song that kind of is elevated uh, into something a little more universal than that while taking energy from what's happening in the headlines. You know, I think that's the sweet spot that Dylan hit. How many years must the mountain exist before it is washed to the sea? Yes, and how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? Yes, and how many times must a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? The answer, my friend, is a blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. There are no specifics in blowing in the wind. It's like we shall overcome, you know, it's, it's an anthem that, uh, I mean, I don't suppose Dylan was actually thinking at the time he wrote it, 
people will still be singing this in 60 years time, but, uh, but they are, and you can, you can easily see why, because he's distilled something universal, something that uh, transcends the, the, the specific and the particular. And this is where the whole problem that he will subsequently have with being the voice of a generation begins. In that song, he is casting himself, whether he likes it or not, as the voice of a generation.